Bonjour, bonjour. Tout le monde. Early birds. Night owls. My name's Danny Whitaker. This is my own worst enemy. Mental health podcast. Before we get stuck into this week's episode, I think a little bit of uh, housekeeping is in order. So, it's been about six, seven months since we posted the first episode on depression with Chris Dowrick. That was back in uh, mid-September, I think. And um, today's episode brings us to number 15. So an average of about one episode every two weeks, something like that. And so far, we've had, between the YouTube and SoundCloud accounts, uh, we've accumulated something like 22,000 listens and uh, currently averaging about five to 600 listens a week, which uh, I know in the grand scheme of things, that's nothing really. You know, it's like videos of Pomeranian dogs having sex with teddy bears and, and frat boys waxing their ass cheeks that get like 20 million views and stuff. But uh, I don't suppose we're of that market. Uh, it's, I tell you what, it's even more pathetic when you compare it to podcasts like like Joe Rogan, Joe Rogan Experience, he gets something like 60 million downloads a month or something insane like that. Um, YouTube, YouTube's a funny one. Uh, I got uh, an email from YouTube a couple of weeks ago um, congratulating me on getting my first 100 subscribers. <laughs> it's like, yeah, six months to get 100 subscribers, thinking, Jesus, at this rate, it's going to take me till I'm about 80 just to fill a, a town hall meeting room <laughs> of subscribers. Um, but thing is, I suppose like with, with the nature of this podcast being what it is, I don't suppose I can expect massive growth in the, the long term anyway, and certainly not rapid growth in the short term, because I think the, the, the difference between this podcast and, and a lot of others is that this one isn't necessarily very shareable. I mean, if you think about, you know, if you've got like a, a comedy podcast or a tech podcast or history, whatever, even if you've got ones that are kind of similar in nature to this one, like a psychology podcast or self-development, those are kind of, they're okay to share. You know, it's okay to tell your family and friends that you're listening to this and to, to recommend it to them. But I think a podcast that's explicitly about mental health, that's kind of different. You know, people might not want other people to know that they're listening to this podcast. And that's understandable. I mean, you know, not everyone's like me. Not everyone wants to go shouting it from the rooftops that they're raged in the head. <laughs> um, but here's the thing. A couple of people have, a couple of people have stuck their head above the parapet and gone out of their way to help promote this podcast. So even though the stats are meager, you know, growth is growth. Um, so I just wanted to take a moment to say to those people that have engaged, uh, I genuinely appreciate the the retweets and the the shares on Facebook and the like the thumbs up on YouTube. Uh, Yasmin on Twitter, you deserve a special shout out. You've been very generous with that retweet button. Um, and to to those people who've commented on the the blog and the YouTube channel, uh, I appreciate you taking the time. You know it helps helps build engagement, helps start a dialogue about all these different topics. To the people that have emailed me, words of encouragement again. Those are very welcome additions to my inbox. And uh, to the, the two people who have posted a review on iTunes, um, Fagan J, I think he's one, and uh, Blue Girl 78 you guys are freaking rock stars. Um, I didn't even notice those reviews had been posted until the other day. Um, I don't check iTunes very often. I'm, I'm not an iOS user, and um, iTunes doesn't actually provide podcasters with any stats or anything anyway so yeah I don't use it very often and uh yeah I went on the other day and there were these two five star reviews there that these two people had written and uh yeah it made my day that I was proper chuffed with that so yeah thank you to all those people and um yeah to the rest of you if you get anything out of this podcast if you want to take a minute to like it share it tweet it review it whatever it's um it's it's always genuinely appreciated um, oh, it feels a bit icky asking you to do that, like soliciting compliments. I feel like I should be on a street corner now, showing a bit of leg in fishnets, <laughs> thumbing down rusty old transit vans. All right, moving on. Today's episode, sleep and insomnia. 
My guest today is Professor Jason Ellis. Jason is Professor in Psychology at Northumbria University and Director of the Northumbria Centre for Sleep Research. He's the author of The One Week Insomnia Cure and in 2013 served as resident sleep expert on BBC One's two-part series Goodnight Britain. In 2015, he led the first ever study to attempt to treat insomnia in the acute phase, that is before it becomes chronic, and found that almost three quarters of participants saw improvements in the quality of their sleep following a single one hour therapy session. Jason has presented his research at numerous conferences around the world and is also actively involved in both public and professional engagement activities, speaking at the likes of the British Science Festival, uh, a TEDx conference and the National Science Learning Centre. In today's episode, we discuss insomnia and how it relates directly to mood and mental health. So, what is sleep and why does it matter? How do a couple of sleepless nights turn into chronic insomnia for some people and nothing more than a few groggy shifts at work for others? We discover how the quality of our sleep can predict your likelihood of developing depression, why seasonal affective disorder is more of a sleep problem than a mood disorder, how daytime napping could be a sign of underlying health conditions and the limits of medication. We also discuss some of the more curious aspects of sleep, such as why we sometimes start body popping just as we're about to nod off, uh, why couples shouldn't share a duvet, why none of us should be shy when it comes to trying out a mattress in a bed shop, uh, why playing Candy Crush at bedtime could be messing up your circadian rhythms, and also what circadian rhythms are, if you don't know what they are, and also how having sex in the kitchen could potentially help you sleep more soundly. You can follow Jason on Twitter. He's Jason G Ellis 101. That's Jason G Ellis 101. If you'd like to comment on this episode or just read the show notes, you can do so by going to myownworstenemy.org forward slash podcast. And as I always say, without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Professor Jason Ellis. Okay, Jason Ellis, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Danny. Okay, today's topic is sleep, insomnia, and how all this kind of relates to mental health. Mm. Before we dive in, though, okay. I always like to find out a little bit about the person I'm speaking to okay. um, and how they came to study their particular speciality. So if you'd like to take us back to the beginning. <sighs> Goodness me. In the beginning. So when I was doing my psychology degree in London, as part of the degree, the last year, you had to go and work out in the community for four weeks. And whereas all of my colleagues wanted to go and study children, either children, language, children and play, uh, I asked if I could work in the area of death. And I was told no. So I, I asked... Sorry, my... sorry, sorry. We have to stop there already. <laughs> you were asked to work in the area of death. Yes. Okay. I need to know what the interest was there first before we get to sleep then. That's fascinating. Well, previous to that, we'd done some work on bereavement and I found it fascinating as an area. And so I wanted to look at much more in depth of sort of people's experiences of bereavement and death. Right. So that's where that interest came from. Um, I was told that I wasn't allowed. Uh, and so I asked my tutor, what's the closest thing to death? And he <laughs> said, sleep. Yes, well, that fa it's a f famous um, little, is it an aphorism that sleep is the cousin of death? Absolutely. Yeah. So that's where, that's where she clearly was coming from. And so... I chose to go to St. Thomas's Hospital in London. It's got a sleep disorder unit and they were happy to receive me. I ended up spending a year working there rather than four weeks because I loved it so much. And then I remember saying to Simone de Lacey, who was running the laboratory at the time, and I said to her, you know, what happens to all those people that don't have obstructive sleep apnea where they stop breathing at night or where they have narcolepsy, in other words, they fall asleep uh, at inappropriate times. I said, what about those people with insomnia? What happens to them? And she said, nothing. There's nothing we can do for them. We send them back to their GP. 
And that really sparked my interest then in not only sleep medicine, but particularly in the area of insomnia. Right. Okay. Right. So doing a little bit of um, the little bit of research I've done on you yeah. personally, <laughs> uh, one thing that came up was uh, I think a, re- a recent study you've done saying that it was able to cure seventy three percent of insomniacs with a one hour therapy session. Yeah. So quite heady goals for today, considering we've got an hour to deal with. <laughs> um, but as you, you mentioned, then that these different sleep disorders. So you've got you've got things like say sleep apnea and what were some what were some of the other ones? So you've got sleep apnea, which is in breathing. You've got narcolepsy, where people fall asleep at inappropriate times, and usually in response to a very heightened emotion. You've got periodic limb movement disorder, and that's where your legs flick during the night. We normally think of people, you know, doing a big sort of big feet jumping, and it's not. It's actually a quite a small flick but it still does have a big impact on the daytime. We've got things such as parasomnias, so that's sleep walking, sleep talking, sometimes sleep eating. And then you've got other disorders such as restless leg syndrome, where people can't get their legs comfortable before they go to bed. And it sometimes can really stop them from getting off to sleep at night. So there's a whole range of sleep disorders out there. Uh, I choose to focus on insomnia. Yeah, well, I was going to say, unfortunately, for all those people listening that have heard one of those disorders and thought, oh, that's me, we're not, we're not helping you today, I'm afraid, we haven't got time. Uh, we're doing specifically uh, in, mm. in, insomnia, but also how insomnia relates to mood and, and, and mental health. Yeah. So, right, where are we going to jump in here? I'll tell you what we'll do with... One thing, one article of yours, which has been plagiarized the crap out of, is oh. Jason Ellis's top ten tips for sleep, <laughs> and th- th- that's been co- they've been copied by people and, and reposted all over the place. Right. So what I, what I thought we'd do is I know that people listening to this, especially people with insomnia, they listen to a podcast like this and say, look, yeah, the, like the neuroscience of it is great and 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 yada yada yada, but just how the hell do I get to sleep? Yeah, but. I want to cover both. So I think what we'll do is I want to kind of, I'm going to navigate through these pieces of advice that you, you given out okay. and then we'll kind of delve into, to each one and, and, and get the science behind it. Because I think often when, like with exercise, um, it's one of those things that people say, you know, it's, it's a great idea to exercise. It's great for your mood, but mm. then it, you kind of left, well, right. well, why is it good for your mood? And what's the actual, um, the, the physiological process behind it that make that the case? Exactly. So before we jump in, I think a, a really good question would be, what is sleep mm-hmm. and why does sleep matter? Okay, what is sleep? Now, there's a very good question, which we still haven't fully answered yet. Um, and maybe that's because of the technology that we've got. Probably still not sophisticated enough to answer some of those questions. But what do we know about sleep? Well, we know that generally people do it with their eyes closed, they lie down and they become quiet, hopefully. And then in terms of the brain, what we see is that there is there's something called the hypothalamic bridge. And that's a lovely word, but you've got to think of it like a portcullis. So in the daytime, it's open. So we receive information from all of the other parts of our body, travels up to the brain and tells us, We're moving our hands, we're walking, we're talking, we're responding. That bridge comes down at night. So in other words, all of the signals that we get from the body can't go to the brain because the brain is actually trying to reprocess itself, to fix itself, to repair itself and get us ready and refreshed for tomorrow morning. And so we need less stimulus knowledge from the outside world. We try to keep the outside world and our internal sensations away from waking us up. So the portcullis comes down, then we can start really sleeping. And what we mean by that is there's two different types of sleep that we've recorded. The first is called rapid eye movement sleep. And rapid eye movement sleep will take about 20 to 25% of the whole night. And characterized, interestingly, your brain waves look 
pretty much the same as if you were awake when you are in REM, rapid eye movement sleep, um, you'll see that the body should be in a state of paralysis, however, and the only things really that are active at that point is your eyes will shift, hence why it was always called rapid eye movement sleep. You'll still be breathing and you'll still be doing all of those other biological functions, but everything else should be lowered down. So that's REM. And then everything else, so 75% of sleep uh, is characterized as non-REM. So in other words, everything else but. Now, there's a very interesting reason why REM was identified, even though it's the smaller part of sleep, and then everything else was sort of pretty much ignored for quite a while. And that's because sleep medicine really started in the area of psychiatry. And what we can tell is that REM gives us some very good indicators of people's mental health. And that's why people have focused very strongly on REM for so many years. The other stages of sleep, non-REM, well, they're called stage one. Not exactly creative, but it was stage one, stage two, stage three, and stage four. And what you've got from there is that the brain is slowing at each of those stages. And so what you're seeing is it's going into a much deeper, refreshing form of sleep. So that's pretty much what we know about sleep in terms of its overall architecture. Why do we sleep? There's a lot of theories out there. Is it there to restore the body and the mind? Is it there just to give us a period of downtime, especially when predators are more likely to be around? Is it there so that we can fix the brain? Is it there so we can fix the immune system? Is it a period where we consolidate learning? In other words, everything that we've learned throughout the day, we're going to try to determine what do we need? What don't we need? And we do the transfer, almost like on a computer, you're transferring it into the long-term memory. We still don't have a definitive answer. My theory is it's a bit of everything. And why would I say that? Because always looking at what happens to people when they don't sleep. Oh, if, okay. if they don't sleep entirely or if their sleep is fragmented, what you'll see is there's some short-term outcomes. You know, people's mood gets affected, their problem solving, their ability to manage and cope. So you can see lots of those performance issues in a short term. But in the long term, we're now seeing lots of relationships with poor physical health, poor mental health. And so you're starting to see that sleep actually has a very big biological function. Yeah, there is. Um, I can't remember it off the top of my head. There is um, a, a rare condition where uh, some is it familial sleep disorder, a very rare condition where people do stop sleeping altogether and you do eventually die from it. That's right. It's called fatal familial insomnia. Um, it's an interesting one because it really isn't insomnia because insomnia is very, very different. What fatal familial insomnia is, is parts of the brain degenerate and the parts that actually regulate sleep, they degenerate quite quickly. And so the individual will stop sleeping more and more and more as the days progress. Unfortunately, there's no cure for it. It is very, very rare, though, and it is congenital. You do see it in families. Yeah, just in, just in case you start panicking out there, people, because you've not had a few nights sleep, I think it's, it's something like 100 cases have been recorded in total, out yeah, of however many, many billions of people in, in 50 years or something, so don't panic. <laughs> um, yeah. And generally, you, you'll know if you've got it because a fem member of your family has had it, so right. it's not too much to worry about in that respect. Yes. So, okay, so you, you, mentioned, you mentioned briefly then th this link between REM sleep and being able to kind of link it to somebody's mental health. Mm. So if you could kind of go a, a bit deeper into that and then, and then also kind of just linking what we know about sleep and mental health in general as well. Mm. Yeah, certainly. What we know about REM is that in a normal sleep cycle, so when you get into bed at night, you will go into stage one and you're not officially asleep at that point, but your brain waves 
have started to slow down a bit. It's what I call the mmm stage. You know that warm, cozy feeling you get in bed? That's stage one. And then for a lot of people, they'll have a jump. And it's almost like they've stepped off the pavement too quickly or they've missed a step. And that's the hypnic jerk. What's happening there is your body is just having one jerk of energy so that it can really relax. And so it does help you relax into deeper sleep. So then you'll go from stage one, you'll have your hypnic jerk. We still have them, sometimes we don't feel them. Then we'll enter into stage two, stage three, stage four, and then we go back up into stage two, check the environment, make sure that you know there's nothing dodgy in the environment that's gonna do us any harm. Once you've done that, you will then enter into REM. Now that REM takes about 90 minutes to get to. So you're not really supposed to have REM until about 90 to 100 minutes. What we've discovered, and this is research that's been going on since the, the 60s and 70s, is that you can tell an awful lot about abnormalities, both in terms of lifestyle and in terms of mental health, by REM. And so if REM comes in very quickly, and the general rule is if REM's coming in between 45 to 65 minutes instead of 90 to 100, it means that there is some problem in terms of mental health. Depression, anxiety are the two that we most associate with that early onset of REM. Now, what's interesting about that is that studies have actually shown that that shift, in other words, that occurrence of early REM actually happens before the depression is realized. So it's almost like an early warning signal that your sleep will start to degenerate in terms of moving REM forward before you actually become depressed. And so that gives us a very interesting insight into the relationship between sleep and mental health. What we know, people with depression, for example, about 90% of them will have problems sleeping. Mm. And so, of course, the question has always been, if, you know, what comes first? Is it the sleep that does causes the depression or is it the depression that causes the problems with sleep? For a long time, we didn't really know. And then there was some very good work that came out of um, University of Freiburg in Germany by someone called Chiara Baglioni. And what Chiara showed was that if you're not sleeping well, if you have insomnia, there is a significant risk that you will develop depression in the future. So she was one of the first people to actually say, well, actually, insomnia is a significant risk for the onset of depression. What Chiara didn't do is look at the biological mechanisms. So she didn't really look at what might be causing that relationship. What's changing in someone's sleep that makes them more vulnerable for depression? And that's where some of our work has happened, where we've looked at people who have never had a sleep problem in the past. They've never had depression in the past or anxiety or anything like that. In other words, good, normal, healthy people. And then they were going through their very first episode of insomnia. And, and it was still quite early on. So it was within the first three months of their insomnia. And so what we did is we were looking at, well, you know, what is the sleep signature of this early form of insomnia? And what we found is that people who have this early form of insomnia are more likely to spend more time in stage two, uh, less time in slow wave sleep, that's stages three and four, the deep refreshing sleep. And that was all very interesting. And then we followed these people up after six months and a year. And then what we wanted to do is see whether any of those characteristics in their sleep predicted which ones of those people were going to remain with insomnia in the future or those who naturally got better. What we found is that those people who ended up going into a long period of insomnia, in other words, it going chronic, well, they were more likely to show a very quick onset of REM. So that got me thinking, because I've read all of the past research in the 70s about you know, REM and depression. 
So what we wanted to do then is check how many of these people actually developed their very first onset of depression. And we found that those people who have this early onset of REM during their early insomnia are also more likely, significantly more likely, to develop depression later on. So that gives us a, a certain insight into one of the potential mechanisms behind sleep and depression. Now, of course, sleep is not going to be the thing that causes all depression, but it is a significant risk factor, at least in terms of if we start to see sleep going wrong, uh, there's a very strong term we use, which is something wicked this way comes. And we're then looking, okay, we need to start looking at helping people not to develop this depression. So um, is there a kind of person that's going to get insomnia uh, and whether that's somebody that tends to have a, a, a kind of sleep cycle, whether there's kind of anything interesting from a kind of a, an epidemiological perspective, who's, who's at risk of developing insomnia? Who's at risk? Um, it's an interesting one. We, we've been looking for the gene, <laughs> and that does that always tends to amuse me. We're looking for one gene to yeah. rule all. Oh, if, I've got to say, if there's one thing I've learned doing this podcast, it's that genetics is rubbish at, at, <laughs> at predicting anything. I don't even know why people bother with it, because every time it comes up, it's, it's always like, oh, well, maybe there is, maybe there isn't. Useless. I think this is where maybe some of the technologies are are getting there, but they're not there fully yet. And so, you know, the research that's been looking for the insomnia gene uh, hasn't actually found one. Uh, and that's understandable because there's going to always be a genetic environment behavior, um, really, concophony before somebody will develop insomnia. So the other way of looking at it is, well, what sorts of people develop insomnia from an epidemiological perspective? And what we do know is that women are twice as likely to develop insomnia than men. As you get older, you're more likely to develop insomnia. Sadly, if you've had insomnia in the past, you are vulnerable to insomnia in the future. And then you've got some of your personality traits that we've seen that are associated with having insomnia. People who are perfectionistic, people who have high impulsivity, people who are neurotic. And those three are generally the, the, the tripart of personalities. People who are very worry prone, anxiety prone, they're also the more likely to develop insomnia but it does need something to kick it off. So when you say it needs something to kick it off, well, I think that's, that's, that's a good segue into this question, kind of defining what exactly insomnia is. Are we talking about, is there a biological mechanism behind it? Is it behavioral? Is it down to life events? Is it all of the above? What, ex what exactly is insomnia? <laughs> what is insomnia? Well, it's gone through a lot of, changes in terms of definition over the years. But the definition that we have now that we, we strongly hold to, which is from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, uh, DSM-5, and that is a complaint by the individual of either a problem getting off to sleep, staying asleep, or waking up too early in the morning. It has to be despite having adequate opportunity for sleep, because let's face it, if you don't give yourself enough time to sleep, of course you've got a sleep problem. Yeah. It should be for at least three nights per week. And the reason for that is that we know that everyone will have an odd poor night anyway. Even the most hardened good sleeper will have the odd rubbish night. It should cause or be related to distress or sort of dysfunction in occupational or psychosocial functioning. In other words, it should have an impact on your day. And here's the final one, really, is it should be present for at least three months. Now, that's an interesting point. And where we got to, to decide three months was the cutoff, I have no idea. I think people sort of got together and went, I want six months. I want one month. I will agree on three. But in essence, what it does do is it tells us something about 
the natural history of insomnia. One of the strongest things that we do know about insomnia is that what causes it in the first place, what triggers it off, is not the same thing that keeps it alive. So what triggers off insomnia, and that could be anything, that could be a stressful life event, such as a bereavement or a divorce or money trouble. It could be daily hassles. You know, we've all had one of those days where absolutely nothing has gone right, and we've ended up not sleeping well as a result of it. It could be a rapid change in our environment. So jet lag can cause or be the start of an insomnia episode. It could be a change in medication. It could be a diagnosis or an illness. So it covers everything in that respect. That's what triggers off the insomnia. And the way I like to think about that is that is the flight or fight response. If your body is under pressure, either psychologically, behaviorally, biologically, the body's response is to not sleep for a bit because it's trying to give you more time to manage the crises. Mm. And so I always see the first element of insomnia, the first two weeks of insomnia, generally they are a biological reaction to stress. Now, what we do know is it's what happens after that initial period. Two weeks to three months, what's going on? And this is what I've been studying for many years now. Why is it that a normal biological reaction to stress can then go on to lead to a disorder which lasts 20, 30 years? And it's actually about what we do during that period. So it's what we do after the initial stressor that will diminish, even if the stress is still about, even if we've still got those money worries, the biological aspect of that, it can't continue for too long. You can't have a flight or fight response for too long. It would damage the body irreparably. So what happens is that stress response will reduce, but it's how we deal with our insomnia during, after that two week period, right the way to three months that really does predict who's going to go on to get insomnia long term and who actually gets better. Yeah, it's always an interesting thing. What causes insomnia doesn't keep it alive. Right. So I think this is the perfect segue now into getting into these tips for getting a good night's sleep, because I'm, I'm assuming that the things that keep insomnia going are going to be the opposite of these tips we're about to go through. Pretty much. So I think we can go through them in, in kind of any particular order and just and, and, and delve in as we go. So the first one is the bedroom is for sleeping. Yeah. So if you could take us into that one. So this is um, one of the main therapies that we use with people with insomnia. It's called stimulus control. If you talk to somebody who's got insomnia, one of the common threads that they'll talk about is that they'll be lying on the sofa watching television in the evening and they'll fall asleep. And they'll just spark out just for a little bit of time. And then they wake up and they think, ah, oh, fantastic. I am sleepy. Sleep is coming. The Sandman cometh. And so what they'll do is they, and, and I see this so much, they creep up the stairs because they don't want to disturb <laughs> and wake themselves up. They creep up the stairs, they open the bedroom door, and it's like a disco comes on in their head. And it's suddenly they're fully awake and anxious. And so what you've got there is a learned response. Somebody who spends a lot of time in bed waiting for sleep, trying to sleep, all they're generally going to get for their money is anger, frustration, and worry. And those three things really aren't that compatible with sleep. I've never met anyone who said, oh yes, I'm so anxious I went to sleep. And so they've now got an association between the bedroom as being quite a negative space. Now, why do we ask people to only sleep in bed? and remove everything else from the environment is because the more, t more things that you've got in your bedroom, the less chance there is that sleep will be the desired response. So think about it, it's a numbers game. I'm going to offer you bedroom 
and a bed. So what are the chances that bedroom will equal bed? Well, that's pretty much, yeah, it's 100%. 100%. Now, what people with insomnia will tend to do, because they spend a lot of time chasing the Sandman in bed, and we get a bit bored. And so we say, you know what, I'm going to have a snack. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to take a drink with me. Uh, I'll take my knitting, my crosswords, my DVDs, some magazines, a book, and my iPad. There you go. Now I've got 10 things in the bedroom. The desired response is sleep. So you've just reduced the chances of sleep and bed being paired together quite considerably. Yeah. That's why we talk about the bedroom is only used for sleep. Some therapists allow sleep and sex. Some people are quite harsh and say, no, just sleep. Wow. <laughs> what, what's your stance on that? Um, it's funny. I've gone through stages throughout my career. <laughs> and these days, I'm feeling more mean. And I say, well, you know, the kitchen is good for something. <laughs> I'm thinking, I'm thinking surely, surely the bedroom should be okay for sex because you naturally fall asleep after doing that. Any, well, I do anyway. So. That's like a true man. <laughs> yeah, so, so there's two things going on there, I suppose. One is if you're, you're lying in bed, you can't get to sleep, and you're stressing, stressing, stressing about it and kind of fighting with yourself, then, you, yeah. then you're getting a negative association with actually being in bed. But then yeah. also, if you're messing about on your iPad and stuff, especially if you're doing work and emails, then you're associating lying in bed with getting things done and with work with wakefulness yeah with wakefulness so when when you're in bed and you, you're struggling to get to sleep mm. get up is that yep. yeah you should get up yep and and do and do what <laughs> uh, uh here you've got two schools of thought so you've got one school of thought which suggests that when you're out of bed in the night you should do lots of lovely, relaxing, quiet things. Uh, you know, you could do some knitting and some reading in some dim light, and you can, you know, do those sorts of lovely, quiet things, write letters to people you've never met. Um, I sort of work on a different premise, and the reason I work on a different premise is a very well example. Uh, I was seeing a patient, young chap, actually, uh, a couple of months ago and we got to the point where I was saying, you know, what do you do when you're out of bed? And I said to him, look, I don't mind what you do. I've got five rules, but beyond that, I couldn't care less what you're doing. And the look on his face was amazing because he thought that I was going to ask him to put himself in an old person's shawl, lie in the corner, you know, drinking some sort of sweet herbal remedy and <laughs> write to his grandparents. Um, so I think that in that respect, we've got to start being mindful of, I don't want this to be a punishment because, you know, being told to sit in a quiet corner does seem a bit of a punishment to me. So my rules are, you're allowed a snack, but no eating. This is not a time to have a full meal because that will disrupt the body clock, the circadian rhythm. No working because that's giving your insomnia a purpose. Don't like you to have alcohol or caffeine because they're also going to disrupt your cycle. No vigorous exercise. Because, again, that will disrupt the sleep cycle. Don't mind if you want to do some stretching or something. And no excessive light. Now, what do I mean by excessive light? The way I usually say it to patients is, I do not want to see your house from outer space. Right. I don't, I would, I don't mind if somebody wants to watch the television. In fact, it's one of the things that I do suggest. You know, get a bucket list of all of those films or programs that you've always wanted to watch. Never had time. And let it go. Do it. It's not to be about punishment. The only other things I will say about that is make sure it's safe. So in other words, don't go for a walk, wander in a dodgy part of town. Make sure that it's safe for other people and don't disrupt somebody else's sleep. That's not fair. So, yeah, I, I'm very much of the opinion of, you know what, tonight is done. Let's deal with tomorrow. Let's get you to sleep tomorrow. 
Right, okay. Well, that's uh, we covered quite a few things there. I think that the, the one that's sticking out to me most is this this idea of, of, of light and how that plays a part. And you mentioned the circadian rhythm there as well. So before I, I've got a couple of questions about that, but if you could just kind of delve into that a little bit about this, what the circadian rhythm is and, and how it's, and its relationship to um, daylight and, and those things. So we have something called the circadian rhythm or the body clock, which is our internal body clock. And it helps regulate things such as our body temperature, how their immune system's working, and the endocrine system. So it's a very important part of our physiology. Now, there's one slight problem with the human body clock. It's not 24 hours for the majority of us. So we would think that it would be. And there, you know, it has led to some people suggesting we might be aliens that have decided to, to visit. But in a lot of people, it sits around 24 and a quarter hours long. Now that causes us a bit of a problem, doesn't it? Because we're in a 24 hour society, but our body clock is slightly longer than that. And so what we also do is we use cues from the environment to regulate us to that 24 hours. And we've got three main cues that do that. Food, light, and exercise. Now, the most common that we talk about is light because it has a biggest impact. Now, if you think about it this way, when we observe light, it'll hit the retina and then there'll be a signal that travels from the retina down the optic nerve and it hits something called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is a big name for a very small thing in our brain. Now, what the suprachiasmatic nucleus is, really, it excites or it inhibits. And alongside that is the production of two hormones. So if it's excited, we stop producing melatonin. If it's inhibited by darkness, we start producing melatonin. And melatonin is a hormone which regulates our levels of drowsiness. So it's our internal sleepy time mechanism. And so light during the day, you will not produce melatonin. Light, uh, sorry, darkness, we start to produce melatonin. And so that really helps us keep to a 24 hour signal. The opposite hormone that we have to that is cortisol. So cortisol gets a very bad rep. It's the stress hormone. Um, but in essence, it helps us to walk and talk and do all of the things that we do. And that works on a almost converse way to melatonin. And so that helps regulate us to this 24 hours. We now know that you've got two other regulatory mechanisms, food. We all always thought that the suprachiasmatic nucleus is the master. So it's the clock in the brain. And around 2007, we started to decide through some studies on animals, which then got replicated in humans, that actually We've got mini clocks, and we've got mini clocks in the heart, the lung, the liver, the kidney, and the pancreas, just to name a few. And therefore, food intake can slightly shift our mini clocks, or what we call peripheral oscillators, which can, if there's enough of them, offset the main clock for a little bit. So we start to see that the circadian rhythm, although is very much driven around the suprachiasmatic nucleus, we also see that there's peripherals that can impact on that, and they come from food and exercise. Yeah, one of the one of the things I've kind of stumbled across accidentally was some people attribute seasonal affective disorder, mm. uh, depression during the, the winter months. Yeah. There's, there's some people think that that's predominantly a, uh, a sleep disorder because it's it's a time when the the circadian rhythms are becoming distorted or messed up because of the, the, the change in, in the daylight times. Do you think there's anything in that? I do. I think the seasonal affective disorder has generally been characterized based upon its symptom, which is the depression and the mood distortion. What I do believe is that there is a very strong circadian component to that because let's look at it. When we start to treat 
uh, seasonal affective disorder. And we do that using light predominantly. When you start to treat people with light who have got seasonal affective disorder, it does have a very good impact. In other words, it relieves the symptom. So my belief, certainly based upon the evidence that there is, is that seasonal affective disorder is what we would call a body clock disorder or a circadian rhythm disorder, more so than a mood disorder. I think that's the outcome rather than the causal mechanism. Would you say for somebody that's either struggling with insomnia or just that the, the, the sleep pattern's out of kilter, so maybe they're falling asleep at like 2 or 3 in the morning – and, you know, ideally they'd like to stay in bed till maybe nine, ten o'clock, but they've, you know, they've got to get up for the kids. Yeah. And so they're, they're kind of building up this sleep debt. Would you recommend to people maybe employing something like a sad light in the mornings and then kind of dark room therapy for, at night to try and get things back in whack? Because like you were saying a minute ago with, with the, the melatonin release happens when we notice darkness setting in. Yeah. Is that something we can manufacture? It is. And, you know, I think that sad lights are excellent. Uh, and I think there are other ways that we can also, uh, we don't have to sit in a darkened room. A good pair of UV glasses, sunglasses will do the job for you. Okay. The one thing I do think um, it's always good to be mindful of is that it's very easy to sometimes mess around with your circadian rhythm in terms of the light when you start to use light and dark so one of the things that i like people to do if they want to go along that route is actually have a chat with a sleep specialist uh, because they'll be able to tell you exactly the point at which you should be using light and the point that you should be using darkness the difficulty is is if you get it slightly wrong it could actually make things worse right so I always like to talk to people, work out where exactly their biological rhythm is. And then from that, we can work towards, right, this is the time that you need to put some light on, go either near uh, you know, a, a, a sad light, and this is the time that you need to put your glasses on. Yeah. And, and another one that's it's kind of big at the moment is this thing with, with mobile devices and blue light emission. Yeah. So blue light is particularly deleterious to our sleep on the basis of it sends the signal very strongly to the brain that it mimics natural light and so it's, it's a natural way that it will switch off the production of melatonin i think the other thing that we've got to be mindful about because we talk about you know these blue light emission uh, emitting devices such as you know our tablets and our computers and all of that sort of thing it's not just about the blue light. I mean, blue light, yes, it does stop the production of melatonin. But also think about it this way. We're actually engaging our mind at the same time. You know, a lot of people have shown that it's even when somebody's passively just watching something, yes, the blue light does have an impact on sleep. But if you're actively doing something like social media or engaging in email or work, that's engaging the brain in two ways, not only the direct way through the emission of the blue light, but also through getting your brain to switch back on and start thinking about, oh, what should I say in that email? What should I respond to X? Because, you know, she's just posted that she likes my, my new garden tools or whatever it might be. And so we've got to be mindful that because a lot of people are now buying these blue blocker uh, screens, it's not all about the screen. It's about the habit. It's about the habit. Yeah. So what what would be a good general rule of thumb for people to, I'm, I'm guessing, ditch the devices completely in the evening would be ideal, but maybe how, how long before sleep? Generally, I, I'll talk about giving yourself a wind down time of about two hours before sleep. And that just gives you that real break. I like to call it putting the day to bed before you go to bed. Oh, I like that. Yeah, switching, switching down. And I don't mind if you're still watching something on the television. As you can see, I'm very pro-television. Um, <laughs> I don't mind if you're watching something on television, but it's having those blue lights and that active mind within two hours of bedtime. You know, who opens their email and then jumps longingly into their bed? Mm. 
Not many of us. Okay, moving on. What do you think about what would be the rule with making yourself comfortable investing in uh, like a decent mattress and how important is that? Because obviously, you know, we spend a, th a third of our lives yeah. in bed, which is ridiculous when you think about it. You live to 75, <laughs> that's 25 years of it's asleep. Yeah. Do you find it a common thing that people don't take the time and the effort to invest properly in that? And if so, what can people do about it? It is a funny thing. We don't invest a lot of time looking at our mattresses and our bedding and all of those sorts of things. And, you know, I, I always liken it to an analogy. You wouldn't go and buy a car just by sitting in it for two minutes and then jump out of the car immediately because you might be seen by other people uh, and then say, yeah, I'll have that one because you're <laughs> shamed into it. But we have this weird thing. And I don't know whether it's the same across the world, but I've seen this in stores in the UK. You know, people will jump on the bed and then they'll roll off really quickly. <laughs> yeah, they do. <laughs> it's like, oh, yes, I've been told I have to try this out, but I don't want to be seen. Um, <laughs> yeah. Suddenly we become terribly vulnerable when we're in, uh, in a showroom. And, you know, really check it out. You know, you're going to be spending a hell of a lot of time on this thing. You need to check it out. If you've got a partner, get them to get on the bed as well. Roll around for a bit. You know, we should be really enjoying that experience because we are going to be living with that experience for quite a while. Um, how important is the mattress and the bedding? There's another issue, and this is where we need to separate out sleep disorder and sleep health. So sleep health is generally somebody who doesn't have a sleep problem per se. They might have the odd bad night here, there and everywhere, but they're generally okay. On the other hand, you've got someone who's got a sleep disorder or sleep problem, such as insomnia. Now, the one thing I say to people who have got a sleep problem, sleep disorder, is things like bedding and mattresses, and this fits into something wider called sleep hygiene. Sleep hygiene does not cause a sleep disorder. As such, sleep hygiene is not going to fix a sleep disorder. So that new mattress and that gorgeous new duvet is not going to fix your insomnia. What it will do is if you've got sleep health, it just helps increase that a little bit. So, you know, it might add a little bit to a more luxurious or a more refreshing experience. But for someone with a sleep disorder, I don't think really, unless they are sleeping on wooden slats with nails in, generally, it's not going to fix the problem. Right, okay. Uh, just an another thing that's kind of worth mentioning for people is a lot of these, uh, there's a, quite a few specialist ma like mattress companies, these internet based companies that have uh, popped up and they, they create these, you, you put all the kind of sleep that you like and maybe you've got a partner and they, they can uh, they can customize it both sides for each person. But also interesting what, what uh, a lot of them are doing is they're giving like, they're giving you like 90 days to try these mattresses out. And then if you don't like it, you can just send it back and get your money back. So that's uh, that's definitely worth it. Oh yeah. Um, so believe it or not, people, I know we haven't gone point by point through through each one of these, but we are, we are actually we have actually covered all these ten points. And I think what I'll do in the show notes, I'll, I'll do what everyone else has done and plagiarise Jason's <laughs> ten tips <laughs> and include them so you can go through them. But there are, are a couple couple uh, of other important ones <laughs> worth mentioning. So uh, temperature and napping. So we'll take temperature first yeah. what what's the ideal temperature to to sleep in and you know how how how's someone going to manufacture that yeah it's a good question because we're all slightly different and so it's about finding what temperature works for you and this is a particular issue that you get with um women going through the menopause because heat becomes a big issue and very disruptive to sleep and so i can't say there's an ideal temperature that's going to suit everyone at all times it's right. really about finding out what's best for you. Cool is better than warm. That, that, that is a, that's, a, that's a no. It's better to have a cooler environment than it is to have a warm environment because it's very easy for the body just to maintain heat. And heat generally is associated with being awake. The way that I like to talk to people about temperature is really about how they manage their duvets. 
So this is one area where you can actually say that you can have an impact from something in the bedding arena. Yeah, one of the, the, the key points I always talk about is if you've got a couple, get two duvets because you both have different, different temperatures. And what happens is there is the all, almighty bedtime struggle where people will fight over a duvet. And, and I do this myself, uh, hence why we have two duvets now, because I will cocoon myself, then I'll get hot and I'll throw the whole thing off, but I won't throw it over the other half side. Oh, no, 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 no. It stays on my side in case I need it again in the night. Uh, and I may or may not need it. That does tend to lead to a few morning discussions, let's say. You know, I mean, what couple haven't had the discussion about duvet hogging? Oh, yes. And so what I talk about is getting two duvets and making them slightly bigger than the sum of their parts. So in other words, if you've got a double bed, get two doubles because then you've got enough room that you can maneuver around. You know, if you're sitting with a single duvet on a double bed, it may end up leading to theft in the night. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, as soon as one leg comes out, it's like, right, I'm having both. <laughs> I always talk about getting two duvets, two double duvets for a du double bed. That way, and you can actually then, because there's so many different um, togs that you can get now, you know, you can get your winter ones, you can get your summer ones, you can get ones which actually put both together, which are fantastic. And therefore, you can mix and match to what you're feeling at that time, as well as what's going out in the external world, whether it's summer or winter. And I think temperature regulation really hasn't been dealt with terribly well by sleep medicine. I think it's a burgeoning area where there's a lot more research to be done to see how we can actually therapeutically help people in that area. I know there's some work in Holland that's been done, um, but really it hasn't you know, come mainstream yet. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't the, the body's temperature, doesn't that naturally drop it does. during sleep anyway? So I suppose that if you're, if you're too hot in bed, it's not just a comfort thing. It's almost that you're counteracting the, the biological mechanism behind sleep. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Oh, th th this, is a, this is a huge one, especially for me. So what are the rules on napping? <laughs> again, it, it, again, you've got to distinguish between sleep health and problem sleep. And even within problem sleep, you've got to be a bit mindful of some things. Sleep health, you know, I generally will say I don't mind people napping. If, however, you've got a problem getting off to sleep at night, don't be napping. The reason being, and, and the way I talk about that is, is I, I try to make the analogy with food. And uh, imagine having the most enormous buffet lunch. In the evening, you're not going to be that hungry, are you? You're going to struggle right. to eat. So if you take that analogy and put that onto sleep, a big, long nap is going to make it harder for you to sleep at night. But if we take the analogy one step further, I'm going to give you a nice sandwich half an hour before your dinner. Are you going to be hungry for your dinner? Not really. And so not only long naps, but naps close to bedtime, they're the things that really can offset your ability to fall asleep. And it's because we have a drive to sleep. As well as the circadian rhythm, the other main biological process that goes on is we have something called the sleep drive or the sleep homeostat and it works on the premise of you wake up in the morning all being good you should be lovely and refreshed as the day progresses just as if you were getting hungrier you get sleepier and that sleepiness continues to build until the desired response you fall asleep once you've fallen asleep the drive is met so after you've had a meal that drive to eat is met, you'll start to build it up again. And it's the same then if you're having a big meal or a big nap in the daytime or even a small nap or a small snack before dinner time, it's going to partially sate that need for sleep. And so it can therefore be a bit detrimental. Now, 
that's when we start to talk about it in terms of a disorder. If somebody is napping in the daytime and they're not sleeping at night, that's not good. The other thing is, and the other way I like to look at it is, do you need a nap? There is a difference between wanting a nap yes. and needing a nap. People who need a nap automatically it flags a red flag to me. We need to see, is there a problem with the quality, the quantity, or the timing of your sleep? If you want a nap, well, that's your own lookout. Yeah, I can, I can imagine people listening to this going, thinking, I fall into that category. I need a nap. Like, I, can, I cannot function mm. during the day if I don't get maybe an hour or two. Right. Somebody with that issue, is that something... Is that something you could overcome by just kind of plowing through for a couple of days mm. and, and hoping things are going to fall back into place? Or are we talking something a bit more problematic going on there? To me, it's always a signal to go and get something checked out. Right. Because if you think about it this way, you know, if you are needing a nap in the daytime, that says you're excessively sleepy. And you should only be excessively sleepy if you're not getting the right quality, quantity, or the timing of your sleep is off. Sleep is restorative. Everyone should be bouncing out of bed, which is you know never gonna happen, um, but everyone should be sort of at least refreshed on waking to the point that they don't need to sleep. If they do, something's not right. And generally, the first thing I would say to someone is go and see their GP and talk about particular illnesses, for example. There may be some illnesses, maybe a change in medication that's caused this. Let's have a look at the biological underpinnings first, and then we would want to look at sleep. Right, and how often do you think something like that can be, you see, sleep problems are often blamed on things like depression and anxiety, yeah. etc. But it's a very nebulous yeah. thing to kind of blame it on, isn't it? And I mean, is that, if, if somebody's going to the doctor and the doctor's suggesting maybe they're depressed, maybe they've yeah. got some sort of anxiety, are people, what's your opinion on whether people should be satisfied with, with, with that response? I don't think that people should be satisfied. I think there is, there is a couple of issues going on here. Medics, certainly in, in general practice, don't tend to have much education about sleep. And, you know, just like any of us, we, we would tend to want to stick in our comfort zones. And so in a lot of instances, people will automatically go to, oh, there must be an underlying issue as to why they're not sleeping well. And that underlying issue is generally going to, you know, people will ask about stress, depression, and anxiety. So there is, has been over many years, this strong tendency, if someone goes to their GP to talk about sleep problem, they'll generally be told, well, let's look for underlying issues, either physiological or mental health wise. I don't think we should be resting on those laurels any longer. You know, we, we changed our diagnostic criteria uh, in terms of sleep medicine. Insomnia is no longer a symptom, it is a diagnosis. And there, therein lies the rub, up until, you know, 2004 was the first real time that's we decided, let's get rid of this whole idea that insomnia is a result of something else. Um, some brilliant work by Jack Edinger. And then, you know, it slowly filtered through. And then we got diagnostic criteria coming in in sort of 2013, 2014, which for the first time is saying, we don't care if you've got diabetes. We don't care if you've got depression. We still need to treat the insomnia. We need to recognize it in its own right and treat it. Um, and one of the other interesting things that came out from that, which actually hit a lot of headlines in the US, was some, some beautiful work by Rachel Mamba and Colleen Carney. And what they've done is that they've treated people with depression, um, with what we call CBTI, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Insomnia. And so what they've done is they've done a series of studies where they treated people with depression, and insomnia, they've given them this treatment for insomnia, or they've given them the standard treatment for depression. And the general outcome is that if you treat somebody's insomnia, the depression will go away. 
If you treat someone's depression, if they've got depression and insomnia, the depression might get better, but the insomnia stays. So again, it leads us to this causal element. Is it the insomnia that's causing the depression? But it actually reached a point where the New York Times actually said, we need to stop treating depression. We need to start treating insomnia in depression. And we're starting to see the same thing in post-traumatic stress disorder, social phobia, lots of the mental health problems we've got. If you actually address the sleep, the other symptoms tend to get better alongside that improvement in someone's sleep. Yeah, that just goes to show the importance of it, doesn't it? Wow. Um, okay, Jason, I think we'd be a bit remiss if we didn't give medication a brief mention melatonin uh, uh, as well um that seems to be gaining in popularity it is. as well if you look around around the internet so what's your what, what's your opinions on on using medication and which types are okay aren't okay yeah i mean the thing is is what we've got is we've got our traditional benzodiazepines and that's generally anything that ends in pam diazepam lorazepam tamazepam those were the traditional sleep drugs that we were talking about in the 70s and 80s. And they did come with a bit of baggage. So the research was showing that predominantly they stayed in the system for quite a while. So that led to a lot of people being quite drowsy and groggy in the mornings. They had an addictive quality to them and difficulty with when you try to come off them, so the withdrawal. And the biggest thing about the withdrawal from the benzodiazepines was you would get something called rebound insomnia. Now, a lot of people will interpret that as, oh my goodness, the insomnia is back. Actually, it's not. This is a very different, this is a medication related uh, insomnia. So you've got your problems with withdrawal, you've got your problems with people driving after being groggy in the mornings, and you've got your problems with people becoming slightly uh, addicted to them. There's also a habituation issue in the sense that they stop working after a short amount of time. These things were not designed to be um, used forever and ever. They were short-term, quick fix, get the sleep back on track. And the whole philosophy around that was if we get the sleep back on track, all of that worry and that anxiety and everything else is going to go away. Now, in the turn of the century, what we started to see was an introduction of the Z hypnotics. So these are Zoplicone, Zimovain, Zolfidem. And I love the fact that they use Z, you know, with the whole sort of catching some Zs. <laughs> and um, these were heralded really as the, the, the new wave drugs. They had shorter lifespan in the body. So they were designed in that way of helping people not have that grogginess in the morning. Also, they were designed on the basis of not having that habituation and that withdrawal. So really counteracting all of the issues around the benzodiazepines. The, the jury is still out um, in terms of how much they actually afford those changes. There's some research suggesting, yep, you know, people can't become addicted to these things. They do have short acting lives and they do, you know, hold that promise. Other people are not so sure. And one thing that happened in the US was uh, they started to see uh, from the Dawn report in 2014 or it was 2013 that there was a 220% increase in ER admissions that they associated with Z hypnotics. Wow. Yeah. And what they were saying is, and I don't think it's actually the drug itself. Uh, I think what they're saying here is what they're seeing is that people were taking it in the middle of the night. So if you woke up in the night, you think, ah, oh, I'll, you know, I'll take my sleep meds. And that was having the carryover effect that you'd see from the old benzodiazepines. So you've got the Z hypnotics. Interestingly, in the UK, you're more likely to be given um, a prescription of amitriptyline. You're more likely to be given an antidepressant. And maybe that's because of the regulatory issues there are around sleep medications and hypnotics. Um, and then, of course, we've got the new drugs on the block, which is your melatonin. And melatonin has been available in the US for a very long time and, and in lots of other countries. In the UK, really, 
only for people over 55 or children with um, certain intellectual disabilities uh, with prescribed melatonin. And I think that's moving more towards becoming more mainstream for all in terms of the melatonin drugs. The issue around melatonin drugs, I've always found that an interesting uh, issue. Increasing melatonin is certainly going to help with the circadian rhythm. Fine. But insomnia isn't really a circadian rhythm disorder. Insomnia is a problem more about the sleep drive, the sleep homeostat. So even though there is some evidence that they do help people with insomnia, I'm, I'm holding out on that one. I'm not so sure. The other thing is, is most patients these days don't want medication. And the guidelines from um, NICE in the UK certainly say that medication should really only be prescribed after you've explored non-pharmacological therapies. But the difficulty we've got in this country is getting access to these non-pharmacological therapies. Um, just quickly, is there any is there any like herbal remedies <laughs> that are, if if they're not going to get you off to sleep, but that are genuinely shown to be relaxing mm. and worth 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 trying, maybe? Or is, he, are they, is there just none? Two issues there. One, there is a vast amount of research in terms of what herbs and lotions and potions are good for relaxation. So I'm not going to knock any of them on that basis. What I am going to knock them on is that people just haven't done the research in terms of what lotions, potions and herbs actually help with sleep. Right. And so if your problem is that you can't relax... Which I, I have to say, when you've got somebody with insomnia for a long time, I don't. They've tried whale song at midnight. They've tried burning orange candles at eleven forty-five, and, and, and <laughs> you know, using some sort of spray on their pillow, dusting it down with fairy dust. Um, I'm laughing because I've done all these. <laughs> most people with insomnia have. They come to me, and they're in my office. And, and we will talk about what you've tried. And they will say, you know, I went to the local supermarket and I started at the top and I went across and I did every single line. Um, <laughs> by the time someone's got a hardened form of insomnia, I don't think relaxation is the main issue that's driving the insomnia anymore. And so, therefore, they may help in the earliest stages of insomnia, but I don't think when you've got it really conditioned and heavily embedded in, they're going to have much of an impact. But... The research just isn't there. Yeah. Right, Jason, before we get on to the quickfire questions, just imagine this scenario for me. So you're stuck it, you're in it, you're getting a lift right. with, with somebody yep. and you're going maybe 10 floors down right. and maybe he recognizes you from one of the newspaper articles and he goes, tell you what, I'm, I'm having a lot of trouble sleeping. You've got 10 floors. <laughs> Like maybe 30 seconds, what the hell do I do about it? How do we sum all this up quickly? Okay, don't try to sleep. So ask five of your friends how they sleep. They will tell you that they do it and they don't know how or why they do it. They just get into bed and it just happens. What you're doing is you're chasing the Sandman. You've got to stop chasing the Sandman. The more you try to sleep, the more effort you put into sleep, the more gadgetry you put into sleep, the more likely it is that sleep is going to be evasive and elusive. Perfect. Okay, my quick fire questions. Firstly, do you have any book recommendations? Feel free to plug your own <laughs> um, and I'll be including it in the show notes. But yeah, any book recommendations on this topic? Mm. There are an awful lot of books out there, I have to say, on sleep and sleep medicine. I, Gail Green has a really nice book called Insomniac, even though I hate the title Insomniac because I don't like the term. Um, and she gives a really interesting journey about how it is for somebody who has insomnia. And I think that's great. Um, Arianna Huffington's book, um, The Sleep Revolution, also brilliant both much more narrative and they're not really for helping somebody achieve or overcome their insomnia for that you'd have to use my book naturally um but they are really good narratives on why sleep is so important and you know so you're not alone the experience of having insomnia 
Yeah, well, I think it's worth mentioning as well, your book includes a, a step-by-step program for somebody to follow on, on a day-to-day basis. Yes, yeah, so, so my book is a very interesting one in the sense that the first thing and the feedback that I've had so far is quite abusing in the sense of uh, I'm not a very um, warm and fuzzy uh, therapist. Uh, it is very much a, on Monday, you have to do this. On Tuesday, if you want to get better, you have to follow this step by step and do it absolutely as, as very prescriptively. And I think that's quite unusual for all of the books that are out there at the moment, in that mine is is very much taking you through. On Monday, you will do this. On Tuesday, you will do that. But, you know, this is what we've seen works. And it would be nice to be able to frame it, couch it a lot more sort of softly, softly. But I don't know if that would be actually helpful to people. I think people want to get on with it. Yeah, well, I think if you you frame it too much as as a... A light suggestion well i think people are less likely to take it seriously then so yeah i mean i i tend to equate this with going to see your gp and if your gp saying well you know if you really fancy taking that medicate <laughs> then, you, know, you, you feel free but if you don't don't worry about it you know if you have that sort of encounter with your gp i'd be looking for a new gp yes <laughs> okay if you could take the reins of power at the department of health what policy would you implement to improve the mental well-being of the general public? Or you can just narrow this specifically to sleep, if you like. Well, I will narrow it to sleep because what I would say is I would make um, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. Um, I'd make everyone aware of it. Absolutely. Right away from clinicians, get that into primary care, get it done quickly into primary care. The one thing that's really bugging me about the Department of Health is we need to start looking at prevention. Preventing obesity, preventing diabetes, preventing coronary heart disease. There is a strong element of in, of sleep in all of them. Let's take an agenda here. Yeah. Right, quite an apposite one, this. What, if anything, keeps you up at night? What keeps me up at night? <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you the funniest one. Talk about irony. Um, I was sitting my exams in Tallinn. Uh, so we have European sleep, uh, behavioral sleep medicine uh, exams. And I was taking my exams in Tallinn. And I did not sleep the two nights before. <laughs> <laughs> I was so stressed because, you know, as a psychologist, then having to learn pulmonary medicine, having to learn you know, endocrinology, pediatrics, and I'm like, I can't sleep, and I've got to sit my sleep exam. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, you know, I think it's, it's, it's quite, re- if anything, it's reassuring that an expert in sleep mm. still struggles with sleep occasionally. We all do, you know. Yeah. You know, and, and as I say to people, I can't put you in Tupperware. You are going to be exposed to stress in your life. You know, there's nothing, there's no way of avoiding that initial period of insomnia. It's about stopping it from getting any worse. What's the best piece of life advice anyone's ever given you? It's okay to say, I don't know. Oh, yes. Yes, very true. Uh, It's not not just okay to say, I don't know. It's it's a brilliant thing to say. It invites knowledge. Yeah. My my ex-boss, Professor Colin Espy, who's now at Oxford, actually said that to me one day. Um, He'd noticed a tendency that I will answer everything and try to give you know, I'll waffle round it for half an hour because uh, <laughs> I don't know the answer. And he actually said to me, Jason, it is okay to say I don't know. And that yeah. that piece of advice has stuck with me ever since. What mistakes do you continue to make despite knowing better? Well, uh, my punctuation is appalling. Um, <laughs> and my apostrophes in particular. What mistakes do I tend to make? It's a really good question. I, I I tend to work too hard on things and tend to be quite perfectionistic about my research. And knowing that, that that's detrimental to you, or can be. It, 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 it's detrimental because it drives my colleagues mad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because I'm constantly saying, no, that paper's not going out. There is a spelling mistake on page 47. And they're like, just get a grip. You know, what part of your career are you most proud of? Um, I think 
when I published the my first paper in our flagship journal, which is called Sleep. Uh, surprise, surprise. And when I published my first paper in there, I, I was over the moon. It was it was a, a crowning moment for me because I thought, yeah, I made it. I'm with all the big boys now and girls. Final two. Outside of family and academia, what investment of time or money has brought you the most joy or fulfillment? Oh, gosh. My, <laughs> my comic collection. Oh, what comic? Or oh, comics? They're all actually... Have you got your um, thingy on? Can you see? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, X-Men. Oh, you're an X-Men fan. I am an X-Men fan. <laughs> um, X-Men is always... I, I love... I, I have a small child in me um, who loves comics, and so we'll always carry on doing that. Hey, it's, it's okay to like comics though nowadays. It didn't used to be, but now the comic guys are the cool kids now. <laughs> I've become cool for the first time in 44 <laughs> years. Okay, finally... The big one. What do you think is the key to happiness? Being able to trust yourself. Because if you can trust yourself, you can trust everybody else. Okay. Is there any links, any social media, anything like that you'd recommend, like to recommend the listeners pay a visit to? Uh, I, I do have a Twitter account, uh, which is at... Jason G. Ellis 101. Yep. Beyond that, find us on Facebook. Okay, what, what's, the, what's the name on Facebook? The Northumbria Sleep Research Laboratory. Okay, sounds good. Jason Ellis, thank you very much. No problem, Danny, thank you. Okay, if you'd like to comment on this episode, you can do so by going to myownworstenemy.org forward slash podcast. That's also where you'll find all the show notes and links to any relevant information. If you'd like to support this podcast, you can do so by leaving us a positive review on iTunes or just sharing your favourite episode with your friends and family on social media. If you'd like to contact me, I'm Danny D. Whitaker on Facebook and Twitter, or you can send me an email to danny at myownworstenemy.org. And until next time, behave yourselves, but not too much, and I'll see you again next time.